About a year ago, I answered a question in my 4,000 subscriber Q&A video that asked, what are your top 10 worst games of all time? And at the time, even though my list was largely off the cuff, I still knew that it was an accurate summation of what I considered to be the absolute dregs of video games, and of what angered me the most out of everything I had ever played. What I did not know was that over the course of the next few months, I would find myself playing a handful of games that were so shockingly horrible that they completely upended my list and almost entirely threw all of it out the window. Was every game pushed out of the top? 10? No, of course not. You'll still see some returning faces from the initial list I made last year, but I hated these new games so much that I could not let my previous list stand as it was. And thus, we have this video. And upon re-examining my rankings, I've thought of even more games that I really should have put on the list in the first place. So even if you remember my list from last year, I can assure you that there will be quite a few surprises to find in today's video. To be clear, this isn't a quest to find the objectively worst games that have ever been made. Because if we did that, we'd end up with a list comprised of nothing but shovelware for the Wii, five minute games made for Achievement Hunters, and Balan Wonderworld. Games like that are terrible, truly awful creations that you are very unlikely to find anybody willing to defend. But they don't anger me. I have nothing personal against any of these games, they're just poorly made. But I have a major bone to pick with every last game on this list, with some of them almost managing to reach the heights of Toy Story 4 in terms of how utterly insulting they are to me, to their respective franchises, and to the gaming industry as a whole. So, without further ado, let's get this show on the road. As a quick disclaimer, I will be limiting myself to only put one game per franchise on this list, because otherwise there'd be absolutely no variety between the games whatsoever. Now then, in spot number 20, we have... Oh, come on, that's not fair. This doesn't belong in your list. It was just a quick little game priced at $1 made as marketing for Benny and the Dark Revival. Doesn't it seem a little excessive to put such a low-effort game on your list of worst games of all time? No, no it does not. I don't care if this game was made in one day or one year, and I don't care if it costs $0 or $100. It pisses me off, and I'm gonna tell you why. The Steam page describes this as a horror game, but none of the user-defined tags do. Why? Well, because aside from the top-down perspective, making it impossible for me to feel any sense of dread because I just feel like I'm nothing but a spectator in this universe. You know, my favorite kinds of jump scares are the ones that take five seconds to trigger even after being caught by the monster. The entire point of a jump scare is to be unexpected so that you jump when you're scared. Sitting on this black screen just annoys me because I know exactly what's gonna happen and I'm not afraid of being caught anymore because it's already over. Not even mentioning the fact that the jump scares themselves are lame and underwhelming anyway. More importantly, the AI is completely unfair. Bendy, for some reason, will automatically lock onto your location and chase after you the instant you gather all the items in the level. Meaning that even if you manage to remain completely stealthy and go unnoticed the entire time, you are still 100% guaranteed to come face to face with him for reasons you have absolutely no control over. Which aside from being an utterly garbage mechanic, also makes zero sense whatsoever because there is no reason why Bendy would react at all to you picking up every item when he doesn't even react to you picking any of them up individually. But it gets even worse, because he also locks in on your location when you get out of the little miracle stations. Hiding places specifically designed to act as a safe haven from the monster where they cannot kill you. But once you collect all the items, if you step outside of the station, Bendy will once again immediately hone in on your position despite not having any way to have reasonably figured out where you are, which is only made even more baffling by the fact that he never reacted to you leaving the stations prior to this point, and only does it after you collect all the items. Literally why? And this can become extremely problematic because if you're in a corner of the map with only one exit point, you could potentially be softlocked and have nowhere to run because leaving will automatically summon Bendy to chase after you no matter what you do. The level design is also atrocious. Sure, it's procedurally generated, which leads to a brand new level every time you boot up the game, but that comes at the expense of carefully paced and deliberately designed sections. The objective of the game is to run around the building looking for random items, jump back into the elevator to go back to the safe house, and then rinse and repeat. But there is absolutely no rhyme or reason to where things are placed thematically. You're just haphazardly flung to random corners of the map because of the procedural generation, which means that you're just running around every which way without having the slightest clue of where to find anything. Which is extremely interesting since this was actually a problem that was in the very first version of Benny and the Ink Machine Chapter Chapter 1 that was then fixed with all subsequent releases. Originally, the locations of the items you had to find were randomly strewn about throughout the whole studio, and they changed every time you played through it, which boiled the whole thing down to a big fetch quest with no thematic reasoning for why objects were placed where they were. Then, for the final version, they updated the game so you can reasonably deduce where things might be, such as finding the record in the music closet or the ink bottle on Henry's animation desk. You'd have thought they learned a lesson after that, but 
Nope, they've gone right back to the same crappy design from the very first iteration of Bendy from five years ago by randomly placing objects all over the map without any consideration for why they're placed where they are. And because it's procedurally generated, this leads to having literally nothing in 75% of the level, and then almost every single object tucked away into one particular corner. It's stupid enough that the entire game was just a glorified fetch quest, but they didn't even bother to make the fetch quest interesting or mechanically functional in any way. And the reason why this game pisses me off so much is because it's emblematic of everything that's wrong with the development team responsible for it. There's a lot of drama that's gone down behind the scenes with the studio that I won't go into here, but what's most pertinent for this video is their mindset of get it done, good enough. There was a substantial amount of evidence to support the idea that their games are made with the mindset of taking the players for granted because it's bendy, they'll love whatever it is, and actively going out of their way to utilize lower quality design techniques for the purposes of getting it done quicker without caring about the actual quality of the games themselves, a principle supported not only by the consistent flood of sludge that's been pouring out ever since 2018 with the buggy Nightmare of Chapter 5, Showdown Bandit, horrendously unoptimized console and mobile ports, and now this game, but also by the Glassdoor reviews of the company, and by the lead programmer who actively defended this method of game development on Reddit. Which only further pisses me off because they clearly know how to make a good game. They know how to make carefully paced, tightly crafted atmospheric horror experiences. For all the flaws of the original Benny and the Ink Machine, they pulled off some really incredible sequences in that game. But they aren't playing to their strengths here, and they haven't been since Showdown down Bandit, with even Chapter 5 of Benny and the Ink Machine failing to take advantage of the strengths of the first four chapters and spiraling the story completely out of control. And this rapid decline in the quality of their games has me exceedingly worried for when Bendy and the Dark Revival finally comes out. Yes, it only costs $3, but that's not a defense and it's certainly not a reason to buy it just because it's cheap. You can get some really good stuff with three whole dollars, but one of those things is absolutely not Boris and the Dark Survival. Quite possibly the most controversial placement on the entire list, but it is one that I will stand behind confidently and assertively because Overwatch is a steaming hot pile of dog water. There are the small things, such as the cancel search and change profile actions being bound to the same input. There are the ugly things, like loot boxes which are universally agreed upon as being horrible regardless of whether or not they're cosmetic only. And then there's the big things, such as the fact that the majority of these maps do not have any flanking routes whatsoever, meaning that the attacking team is forced on a singular choke point with absolutely nothing that they can possibly do. There is no other way around these situations other than brute force and luck because there's no way to flank the enemy and get the jump on them. Of course, I say that, but to be honest, it wouldn't even matter if these maps had the best design in history because the gameplay is fundamentally broken. There is no nuance to the strategy in Overwatch. There are no opportunities for creative outplays thanks to the shallow, one-note hero abilities. There are no opportunities for flanking routes thanks to the suffocating design of the maps, and both of those combine together to restrict any and all possibilities for well-coordinated teamwork. It's quite literally as shallow as the person with the better ultimate ability wins, and, oh, they have this hero, then I shall switch to this hero to counter them. There's no attempt to stick to your guns and think of a creative way to outsmart the enemy with the equipment you have. It's just, oh no, time to switch characters again. That's as deep as the strategy goes with this game. Switch to this to effortlessly counter that with absolutely no deeper tactical options beyond that. But that's not even half the problem. Far more prevalent and aggravating is the issue of blatantly unbalanced heroes. There's no two ways around it. Overwatch's heroes are not even remotely balanced. Shall I list some examples? First up, we have Genji, who can defend deflect any kind of attack people throw his way. Next, we have Soldier 76, whose ultimate ability is literally aimbot. With one button push, he gains perfect accuracy on his targets, and there's absolutely nothing you can do to counter this, which is made doubly problematic by the fact that his base combat abilities are already immensely powerful by default. And Mei can straight up just freeze players and then finish them off with a headshot immediately afterwards. But much like Soldier 76, her base abilities are already broken because absolutely nothing could stop me when I used this freeze ray laser beam thing. I was actually indestructible because this laser is OP as shit. Not to mention that her self-freezing ice block is literally just armor lock from Halo Reach, and that is not a compliment. They both function exactly the same in that you freeze up and the flow of combat is immediately brought to a screeching halt because you are invincible while this thing is active, but can still be immediately killed as soon as the effect wears off, making the thing entirely useless. But at the very least, armor lock can still be used to deliver an EMP effect to disable or destroy vehicles. This thing has no purpose except to piss me off. I could list more examples here, but to be frank, I wanted to jump into a shredder after recording footage for just these three heroes, and I could not be bothered to play anymore. 
especially because I had to wait upwards of 10 minutes just to play a single one of these games. No, that is not an exaggeration. It literally took me almost 10 minutes to find each one of these matches. And the reason why it takes so goddamn long is because of the game's fundamentally broken matchmaking design. The way matchmaking works in this game is that you queue into three different lobbies, tank, damage, or healer depending on what style of gameplay you prefer. This was done to address a major issue that plagued the game at launch, where you could just stack the team filled with the same hero over and over again and break the game in half. So they split the matchmaking into three lobbies and then restricted the number of each type of hero allowed on each team. But just because you alleviated the issue of hero stacking does not mean you've made your game better. In fact, you might have made it worse because damage heroes are what the highest percentage of people want to play as, meaning that the majority of players are going to be funneled into a queue that can take twice as long as the actual game itself lasts in order to find a match. And there is no solving this problem because the game fails on both possible solutions. If you allow the players to stack heroes, then you face off against a team of blatantly overpowered characters, in which case you are just fucked. If you separate players into three distinct matchmaking queues based on their preferred playstyle, then you're forced to wait an excessively long queue time due to the nature of splitting up the team for balancing purposes, at which point you just have to hope that someone hasn't already selected your favorite character out of an extremely limited roster. And if you want to play a damage-based character, then boy, how many does it suck to be you? Enjoy waiting 10 minutes to play a single 5-minute game. Ah, but you see, you can circumnavigate this abhorrent queue system because Overwatch has priority passes for matchmaking. What does that mean exactly? Well, it means that if you don't feel like waiting in the standard queue time, you can use one of your passes that you earn by queuing up for a flex game, where you don't care what role you play as and are rewarded for doing so with the priority pass, which you can then use to get priority treatment and be placed into a shorter queue time. This is absolutely unacceptable. First and foremost, if your queue times are so long that you have to create a fast pass system, then the structure of your game's matchmaking is fundamentally broken and you need to rework it. Second of all, the only way to earn these passes is by playing a flex role where you will end up as either a tank or support, and the only queue you are allowed to use these passes for is the damage role, meaning that if you are so avidly against playing either roll ordinarily that you are going out of your way to earn a fast pass just to play a damage character, then you are now being forced to play as the very roles you despise just for a shorter wait time to play the role you actually want. This isn't just bad for you because you're forced to play as something that you don't want to, but it's bad for everyone else on your team because now they're stuck with a teammate who either doesn't care about the outcome of the game and is only playing this because they have to, or one that is inexperienced with these roles and isn't going to be of any use to you anyway. Finally, and most importantly, because such a high percentage of people are going to want to use this system since the majority of players are damage players, it actually has the potential to make queue time significantly worse as has already occurred previously, because when everyone has a priority pass, NOBODY DOES! Like, this is indefensible, absolutely atrocious game design. It's so blatantly and embarrassingly awful that I'm dumbfounded people to think it's even remotely good. The only appeal this game has is the character designs, and that's it. Because the core gameplay is horrible, and the systems surrounding the gameplay are somehow even worse. Avoid this game at all costs. Look, I don't want to talk about this one any longer than I have to. I have nothing but pain and horror associated with it. But I will say that it's not on the list for the reasons you may think. Yes, of course they contributed to my decision to never touch it again with a 10-foot pole, but the problems with Indiana Jones and the Emperor's Tomb are much broader than this. Put simply, its controls suck. Platforming is meant to be a core component of the gameplay, but the controls actively discourage jumping around the temples because of how insanely clunky they are and how little control you actually have over Indy's movement. But that pales in comparison to how the game controls once you dive below the water. In order to get out of a body of water, you have to push forward on the control stick to grab onto dry land and pull yourself up. But pushing forward is also what you have to do to dive down to the bottom again, which is frustrating by itself, but is made even worse when crocodiles are actively trying to eat you. Speaking of which, I guess we should talk about these guys, huh? I don't know who thought this would be a good idea, but they need to reevaluate everything they understand of competent game design, because nothing about these swimming sections is even remotely fun, thanks partly to the swimming controls, but mostly due to these scale bundles of nightmare fuel. They swim way too goddamn fast for you to be able to evade them, meaning that if you are not literally perfect with your swimming, which is extremely hard to do given the inherently contradictive swimming controls, you're just dead. There's also the issue of the skulls not actually doing anything to distract them. Yes, they swim in the general direction of the skull when you throw it, but even if you throw it as far away as possible and only dive in once they reach the skull, it doesn't matter because once you submerge yourself, they're going to immediately turn heel and make a beeline straight for you anyway. Of course there's the person element involved with 
why I will never play this game again for the rest of my life, and that even just the thought of reinstalling it makes my blood run cold. But you can replace these things with fluffy teddy bears, and I still wouldn't want to play it because the controls are garbage, and the enriching atmosphere and engaging puzzles are sadly nowhere near enough to make up for it. I didn't hesitate to put any of the other games on this list for even a second, but I did for this one because there is a small handful of really creative puzzle mechanics that are worthy of praise. The problem is they're entirely drowned out by the other 95% of the puzzles in The Witness that are complete and utter bullshit. The symmetry mechanics are sort of well communicated, but the problem is that the game does nothing in this tutorial section to teach you that you need to use environmental clues to apply to the line panels. The game conditioned you to focus on nothing but the panels themselves. The desert ruins are creative, but again, there is absolutely no indication you need to do some Indiana Jones shit and look at the panels on the exact right angle for the sun to reflect off them. This isn't even a matter of not knowing to use the environment. Even if you know to look for environmental clues, you still aren't going to notice how the sun reflects off the panels unless you're standing in the exact spot you need to. If you don't notice this, you are screwed! It's not a matter of applying a mechanic you were previously taught to the problem. It's a matter of trying to figure out what the hell the mechanic is in the first place. And those are the only two areas in the entire game that are even remotely close to being well made. Everything else is either extremely esoteric and obscure, or just poorly communicated. The shadow puzzles are simple at first until they just straight up stop making sense. The rules they set up in the earlier puzzles no longer apply for the later ones, and you're just left bashing your brains against a wall. The jungle puzzles are actually bullshit, because there's no clear indication whether pitch, intensity, or volume is what the game is looking for when figuring out whether to draw the line higher or lower. Not to mention the fact that the bird sounds are almost entirely indistinguishable from each other, and that sometimes you can still hear the previous puzzle sound effects of the next puzzle, which only further complicates things because now you run the risk of blending the two soundtracks together. And the boat puzzle audio is even worse, because without a speaker, the ambient noise is not made out to be an intentional part of the puzzle. For as crap as the jungle was, it was at least immediately apparent that sound was the key because the audio was coming out of a speaker. But this is literally ambient background noise with no clear indication of when the audio loop even starts, let alone what sound effect is linked to which colorful dot. And you're supposed to be able to use these noises to deduce the solution to the puzzle. But perhaps my favorite one is the panel in the town in the middle of the island with shadows reflecting down upon it, only you actually aren't supposed to use the shadow mechanics from earlier, you're supposed to find the one angle in town where the sun actually reflects against it. Like, why? Why did you put shadows there unless your goal was to piss me off? And that's a problem that persists throughout the entire game. Some of these environmental puzzles can only be located through accidentally stumbling into the exact right angle you need to look at something from, or by just checking every conceivable angle for every single object until you eventually just want to rip your hair out. The Witness is nothing more than a series of escalating tedium, which is a feeling that's only exacerbated when you see that the store page proudly proclaims over 500 puzzles to be a selling point, despite the fact that so many of these 500 puzzles can't even be constituted as puzzles and are insanely short and simplistic. Quality over quantity. It's an important mantra. Please commit to it, otherwise you'll end up with a massive island with over 500 tablets and an uncomfortable percentage of which is taken up by stuff like this. It's also maddening that they claim to treat your time as precious while simultaneously forcing you to wait inordinate amounts of time for boats to rise up and platforms to extend. Not to mention the absolutely abysmal ground speed and plethora of invisible walls preventing you from going just about anywhere and making navigating the world a massive pain in the ass. You don't need to give me the Master Chief's grapple shot, but a little less obstructive scenery would be nice. And the ending is not worth the turmoil it takes to get there at all. Usually there's some kind of satisfying reward for overcoming a series of difficult puzzles. In The Witness, you just glide through the area and then get reset back to square one. I was baffled when I saw this, like, really? That's it? And the bonus ending doesn't help things either. This final music box puzzle gauntlet is not what I look for in a puzzle game. I don't want to be rushed through a puzzle, I want to take my time with it. And by take my time with it, I don't mean meticulously examine every single object from every conceivable angle, from every possible position all over the island. To buy this game is to pay $40 for line puzzles that could have easily been replicated by a $5 mobile game where you swipe between puzzles because with how small a percentage is actually dedicated to creative environmental puzzles, the beauty of this world does not justify its existence existence in the slightest. Fun fact! If you make a game where the message is, don't smoke, it's terrible for you, and the reviews all consist of people saying it was so bad they went to take a smoke, you might have bungled over yourself somewhere along the way. Yes, smoking is horrible for you. No, you shouldn't do it. This has been a Trevor Magic PSA. But as I've said a million times before, it doesn't matter how benevolent your thematic messaging is if the actual substance of your game is steaming hot garbage. First, the little things. X is the jump button. Why is X the jump button? In what game is anything other than A the jump button? Second, the game runs like 
ass. It's literally just a bunch of hallways, and for some reason, the game just absolutely cannot maintain a consistent frame rate. Just look at this. This is the spawn area for the game. I haven't even left the first room, and it's already stuttering like crazy. No, this is not my capture card. This is the game itself failing to run smoothly. And this was played on the Xbox Series X. How in the holy hell is the game so poorly optimized that even the Series X can't run it well? Why are you trying to give me a seizure with your loading screens? But fine, let's assume you have a blind eye for performance, and can overlook this major stuttering so long as the gameplay is good. Well, I got some bad news for you, buddy, because this game is nothing more than a slew of trial and error challenges. Moving around bookcases until you eventually find the correct path through, flipping switches in random orders, crawling through four doors until one finally leads you to safety, running through a maze where everything looks the same, it's just a abysmal to play. There is absolutely nothing to logically work through here. You just play a guessing game until the torture finally ends. But that's not the worst part. At least with standard RNG sections, you will eventually find the correct pathway through brute force trial and error. But some sections, such as the smoke hallway, have the potential to completely softlock you if you get unlucky. You'll either get the path that allows you to leave, or you'll get the path that traps you in a never-ending looping hallway forever and there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. And no, I don't care that this game is free. That doesn't absolve it from scrutiny when you're hiding behind your virtuous messaging to deflect criticism of your garbage mechanics with, don't you understand? It's all about the theme. Because it's not an easy battle to quit smoking, and only one in four teens can actually do it. Quitting is about more than just skill, and it's a different experience for everyone, which is why the puzzles randomly change every time you play. Fuck off! Stop using thematic messaging to justify broken stories and abysmal gameplay mechanics. You pay zero dollars to play this game, and it's still a ripoff. Never, ever download one Lee's for any reason. Turns out, dressing up the bridge constructor formula with a portal coat of paint and having GLaDOS deliver lines copy and pasted from the mainline games isn't enough to trick me into thinking the game is actually good. And just so we're clear, I love puzzle games, and Portal 2 specifically is among my favorites of all time, so I have absolutely no compunctions about playing a game that intellectually challenges me. Where I draw the line is when the difficulty is no longer generated from logical thinking and puzzle solving, but instead by making micro-adjustments to every individual element of the level before ultimately driving yourself insane from the sheer minutia of it all. The puzzles themselves are brain dead easy. It doesn't take any thought whatsoever to immediately figure out what you have to do and what structures have to go where to accomplish your given task. The hard part is gradually changing the angle of a ramp or the length of a platform. Even if your platform is only one centimeter too short or your bridge is angled less than one degree off, too bad for you. You fail and you gotta get out the microscope to fix it. Sometimes in a Rube Goldberg style puzzle, if the minor adjustment you need to make is all the way at the end of the sequence, then you need to wait for the convoy to reach that point before you can see if the fix was successful and there's absolutely no way to speed this up. You can't fast forward the process, you can't jump to certain parts, you can't begin the test from one specific part of the map just for testing purposes. You have to sit through the entire sequence every single time you need to make even the most minuscule of adjustments and it's utterly infuriating to do this over and over again. A puzzle game should test my intelligence, not my patience. And don't even get me started on the blatant member berry dialogue for GLaDOS that's ripped straight out of the original Portal games. Bridge Constructor Portal is an exercise in dressing up crappy gameplay and pretty portal packaging and expecting people to clap like seals at it, which apparently is exactly what happened. If you like making the smallest adjustments for every single puzzle and being punished for being one degree off even if you perfectly understand the concept and execution of the solution, then I guess this game is right up your alley. Oh, you used to be in the top 10! Whatever did I play to make you fall this far? <laughs> I suppose only time will tell. Don't worry though, I still despise this game just as much as I used to. On a purely superficial level, the cutscenes are just lazy, crappy PowerPoint presentations of screenshots from the movie. Like, really? You couldn't even be bothered to play the actual clips from the movie? You just resorted to a slideshow of images that look infinitely worse than the actual footage from the movie and are of bafflingly low visual fidelity? Speaking of lacking visual fidelity, these levels are ugly as hell thanks to one washed out in unpolished textures which only stand out more thanks to the horrifically unappealing color palettes. But it doesn't just look like garbage, it also plays like garbage because despite ostensibly running at 60fps, it consistently dips into the single digits whenever anything of substance happens on screen which is utterly unacceptable for a game of this caliber, and it still stands to this day as the one and only game I've ever played on the original Xbox that crashed on me. Okay, so the game looks like shit and performs like shit, but what if the frame rate wasn't god awful? Is the game at least fun to play then? No! 
level. No, it's not. Let me tell you why. The levels are linear as all hell with no opportunity for exploration, except for a side area that will warp you out of the level to teleport you to the wacko dimension. There's no sense of seamlessness to the world design. It's a disjointed mess of padded objectives to complete. There's no sense of exploring the depths of a forest or the ins and outs of a city. You're just drawn to random shiny teleportation platforms, which then take you to a random cube land and break your immersion. One of Battle for Bikini Bottom's best attributes is the seamlessness of its world design, and how immersed you get because of how effortlessly the different areas weave together and all the challenges feel like natural placements in the world. But this game doesn't even bother to try to maintain consistency in its world design. With the exception of a whopping two or three bonus levels throughout the game, almost every optional mission you can complete is something that you have to be warped out of the current level to play, which might have been forgiven were it not for the fact that said optional missions are nothing but blatant and unfun padding. Let's go through them, shall we? First up, we have the combat arena challenges, which are nothing but brain-dead button mashers in a static, lifeless, flat area that generally looks like a debug arena developers would use to test out movement controls, not an actual, proper, finished level for players to fight enemies in. There's no dynamics to the combat when it's just a flat landscape, especially when compounded with the actual design of the enemies themselves. Not only do their animations all look jank as hell, but there is absolutely no variation between them. They're all just reskins of each other, and anything that isn't a reskin makes things overly frustrating for all the wrong reasons. Spongeball challenges demand precise platforming out of a movement system that is inherently not precise due to the momentum of the Spongeball, forcing you to completely kill your momentum and take things one step at a time, which is not what this was designed for in Battle for Bikini Bottom. Then we have the driving challenges, with controls slipperier than an eel dipped in oil. The thing is, these things might have been fun to do once, but you get worn out on them very quickly when this stuff is essentially copied and pasted between every single level of the game. The floating block challenges and sliding sections are genuinely fun, but they kind of start to lose their effect when you're forced to replay these sections four times to complete the level, doing increasingly more asinine challenges with each iteration of the repetition. And I don't want to hear about how, well, you don't have to beat the game to 100%, yeah, because that is literally irrelevant. These missions are in the game. They should be fun to play. They don't get a pass just because they're not required to beat the final boss, especially since they can't even be considered as entirely optional because you're still forced to do some of them anyway. Even if you just stick to the main story missions and ignore all the optional side quests, your progress will inevitably be halted by Mindy as she tells you that the plot cannot progress until you find more Goofy Goober tokens, meaning that this stuff is absolutely not optional. The thing is, this progression system of preventing your progress until you collect a certain number of collectibles works for an open world game like Battle for Bikini Bottom because there are many different levels you can go to at any given time, there aren't any padded challenges, and there's always at least one level in each section of the open world that has no spatula unlock requirements. But this is a linear game with nowhere else for you to run. If you get blocked by Mindy, you have no other levels to go to. Your only option is to backtrack through stuff you've already played, trudging through lazily copy and pasted challenges. And as the final nail in the coffin, let's talk about the upgrade system. It's not an upgrade system like Halo Infinite, where there's cool new abilities you can unlock and then proceed to make even more powerful. Every super cool new power-up you can unlock is something that was a baseline attribute in Battle for Bikini Bottom. Spin attack, bubble bash, belly flop, and throwing are all things you could do from the outset in that game that you are now forced to unlock for reasons that defy explanation. And what's worse, this system either breaks the game or breaks your spirit. If you don't get any of the upgrades, then the game becomes too hard. But if you do get the upgrades, then the game becomes too easy. Patrick's cartwheel ability literally breaks every single one of his combat sections. And why bother being rewarded for exploration with health upgrades hidden around the levels when you can just grind for shiny objects to upgrade it instead? And what pisses me off so much about this game is that it is so clearly trying to capitalize off the accomplishments of its predecessor because the movement and camera are just ripped straight from the Battle for Bikini Bottom engine. And as it happens, they are also the two best parts of the game. They not Knocked it out of the ballpark with that game, so they scramble to try to replicate its success by shamelessly taking its perfect movement and camera systems, and then putting as little effort as possible into framing a game around them. The levels aren't fun to move around in because they're just a linear romp from start to finish, so the core movement is utterly wasted on this platforming game that has an alarmingly high percentage of levels that aren't even about platforming at all, and are instead replaced with driving, fighting, rolling, and sliding. There is nothing of substance this game offers that Battle for Bikini Bottom doesn't, so just go play that instead and never give this dumpster fire your time or money.
I don't know that I've ever seen such a stark contrast between the first and second games in the duology. Because the first Famicom Detective Club game, The Missing Air, was good. Really good, in fact. Not amazing. The gameplay definitely shows its age with having to talk to people again and again, even if you already discussed a given topic with them already, and no clear direction for how to progress in the investigation. On top of the fact that a majority of the game's cast wasn't super fleshed out, but what the game did well, it excelled at. But this quality clearly could not be maintained for the prequel sequel because the girl who stands behind completely flew off the damn rails. We went from a very very grounded, well thought out mystery to a completely nonsensical situation that had me cackling uncontrollably at its sheer absurdity by the ending. But perhaps I'm getting a bit ahead of myself, because to even get to that ending, you first have to fight your way through some of the worst pacing I've ever seen. So much of this game is spent talking to the same people over and over again and asking the same exact questions in the exact same locations over and over and over again, while gaining absolutely no new information whatsoever. At least when you were forced to pick the same dialogue option two or three times in a row in the missing air, it was in service of gaining new intel for the investigation. But that is not the case here, it's all just a colossal waste of time. Not even mentioning the wild goose chases you keep going on all the goddamn time, but the most egregious one being the quest to find a Yumi that takes you all over the map and you're left wondering if you're still trying to solve a mystery here. What's worse is that all this insanity leads to a complete and utter batshit crazy climax because this is not how mirrors work. It can be moved off the wall and yet nobody accidentally bumped into it at any point since the incident, which only happened because the main characters chose the only dead end in the school as a viable escape route for them, which then led to the worst knife aim in history, which only happened because Habino was revealed to be the big bad all along, which by itself was just a lazy rehash of the same weak plot twist from the first game. And instead of just killing them in the room, he monologued to them. And that big old monologue he delivers doesn't even resolve everything. Even after all that, major plot points involving the girl who stands behind are not even addressed, let alone resolved by the time the credits roll, with the most blatant one being the unexplained contradiction regarding the actual location of the incident. I was so disappointed by this game. I was stunned at the fact that they had such an incredible first outing with Famicom Detective Club, only to then completely drop the ball for the sequel. The girl who stands behind is inferior to the first game in every way imaginable, and there is absolutely no reason for you to play it. Just go play The Missing Air and pretend this one doesn't exist. Now it's time to talk about the game that taught me what motion sickness was with absolutely abysmal controls. For whatever stupid reason, Sonic just keeps running constantly and the game is almost entirely on rails. There is no sense of you, as the player, making your way through the levels of your own volition and through your own control. You're just forced down a linear path for the whole thing, with the most noteworthy instances of this being any time when you're forced to just slowly shimmy along a ledge. It's not like Crash Bandicoot, where while the path may be linear, it's still up to you to determine when and where you jump and have complete control of the character at all times. Your only means of slowing down is the break button, which completely and utterly stops the game dead in its tracks and any momentum that you previously generated is brought to a screeching halt, which is not at all how a Sonic game's movement mechanic should function. And it's the same thing with jumping. There is no momentum with jumping. You just launch yourself straight up and then cannot move mid-air until you flick the Wii Remote downward, which is emblematic of the overarching problem with this game. The movement is 100% bound to the motion controls, which can work work, motion controls are not inherently awful, and talented developers can use them in creative and engaging ways that don't feel frustrating or restrictive. Super Mario Galaxy makes great use of motion controls, and need I even reference Wii Sports? But not when every single thing in the game revolves around the motion controls. I sure hope you don't miss any rings or anything, because you can't turn the camera to see what's behind you as you walk backwards to get them, so you might run into obstacles along the way, and the only means for walking backwards is to tilt the Wii Remote backward. As for the camera, the way this camera moves is absolutely absolutely nauseating, and it completely spazzes out whenever Sonic jumps. There's a reason I say that it's the game that taught me what motion sickness was. But it's not just the camera and movement that's at fault here, they're the most obviously broken elements of the game, but there's so much more here to go over. In fact, what may very well be the most infuriating element is the fact that you can't just progress through the main missions. You have to complete a whole lot of stupid, tedious side quests like collecting a bunch of rings in order to move on with the story. This entirely wrecks the pacing of the game. If you want to have these quests available as bonus challenges, that's fine. Fine, but don't rip me out of the story just to complete a bunch of pointless objectives running through the same level over and over again. Especially if the premise of your story is that Sonic is on a strict time limit to complete his mission or else he's going to die. Oops. And why is this tutorial so goddamn long and drawn out? Why does it take 20 minutes to run through the base mechanics of the game? Could you not just make the tutorial separate? Well, perhaps instead of dumping everything on the player at once, you could introduce the mechanics incrementally throughout the opening stage or just over the course of the entire game to pace them out better, so you don't force the player to run 
run through the same dull tutorial level 10 times in a row? I played this in elementary school when it first came out, and even as a tiny child, I was still able to recognize how horrid it is. It's the perfect example of how not to implement motion controls into your game, on top of a myriad of other atrocious design choices. And the fact that it's been knocked all the way down from the number 4 slot should be very indicative of the horrors that await us further ahead on this list. A game that should be used in university is to teach students how to completely waste all the potential of your initial prototype alpha. The original alpha of this game was such a simple premise, and yet it was super effective. You have to try to figure out a way to infiltrate your neighbor's house and break into the basement to discover the secrets waiting below. But the neighbor was very perceptive and always listening, paying attention to your methods of entry and movements throughout the house, and using that information to prepare for your next attempt by laying traps and figuring out the paths to cut you off. Was it amazing? No, the house was very simplistic and needed a lot of improvements in order to justify a full-length game, but it was overall still a strong alpha, and it showed the potential of what Hello Neighbor could be with its innovative AI and infiltration mechanics. Yet all of that promise and potential has been flushed down the toilet. The AI is no longer threatening because he's dumb as a bag of rocks. He's not a danger because he's smart, he's a danger because he's broken. He just blatantly cheats. He doesn't lay traps to try to account for your movements and make an effort to outsmart you, he can just teleport to your position, and even if he doesn't, his movement speed is so absolutely absurd that he can reach you unrealistically fast no matter how far away he is. He doesn't react intelligently to your actions anymore, he's just a pain in the ass to deal with. Plus, these puzzles are completely unintuitive. There's things like pulling three obscurely placed levers scattered all over the level to blow off the wheel and then use it on a myriad of other random pipes. But the one that is the most obvious example of my point is what you have to do to get the crowbar. After draining the water and descending into the secret part of the house, which is by no means a small task, you are faced with a dollhouse. The dollhouse looks absolutely nothing like the actual house, and yet you are somehow supposed to deduce that opening the doors in the dollhouse will open the doors in the real house. But even beyond that point, you're also supposed to figure out that placing an object inside the dollhouse will cause it to be placed in the appropriate room in the actual house, while simultaneously growing it, allowing you to take the upsized crowbar. How does that make any sense at all? How the fuck are you supposed to reasonably deduce that to be something that would ever happen? The dollhouse doesn't look anything like the actual house. And that's not even taking into account that in Act 3 of the game, you can use a gramophone to grow and shrink the plants around around the house. How? Why? Just how did you even concoct these puzzles, let alone think anybody would logically figure this out? And why did you fly so off the rails with these mechanics? Remember when the original alpha just looked like a normal house? Yeah, well now it looks like this. When I said the house needed to be made more complex for a full length game, this wasn't what I meant. I meant expand the floor plan with more than just a couple of rooms without much in them. I didn't want you to make a circus house. Also, the majority of the gameplay doesn't even revolve around puzzle solving anyway. It doesn't revolve around stealth mechanics or trying to outsmart the AI. Almost every single major obstacle that isn't an esoteric puzzle boils down to precision platforming. You have to jump across rooftops, stack boxes beneath you to reach windows and trampolines, and navigate these insanely narrow tiny pipes to reach the valves. This does not work. The game is not designed around this style of platforming. The controls are too ridiculously sensitive to the slightest of your movements for any of these jumps to be even remotely manageable. Trying to walk this tightrope when just barely touching the control stick has the potential to send you flying over the edge is pure pain. And do I even need to explain the inherent tedium of box stacking which is only further compounded by abhorring controls in an AI opponent that cheats in order to win, as well as the fact that the pick up button just straight up does not work like 70% of the time, you will press the button down and the game just will not respond to your input no matter how many times you press the button. Did anybody playtest this? How did nobody catch this? How did they think this was even remotely fun? All right, they probably didn't think this was fun because they know that the game garnered a sizable community focused on trying to solve the lore that I can guarantee you the developers didn't even think twice about in the original alpha. But once they realized what the majority of people were actually interested in regards to this game, they leaned way too heavily into mysterious lore and proceeded to abandon the idea of making a good game in the process, complete with death mini games. Now, where have I seen this before? Only instead of being a fun little mini game you can complete, it's literally just walking down a hallway or something similar to that. It's nothing but a tedious shamble to reach the exit until the game finally lets you play again. Hello Neighbor isn't even so bad that you can laugh at it. It's just a painful experience, and I would advise you to never play it no matter what. <laughs> 
perfect game to prove that just because something was revolutionary when it came out, that does not necessarily mean the game has aged well at all. I will never, ever understand why, but this game has quite the cult following, with some regarding it as one of the greatest games ever made, and I have to wonder if these people have ever played any 3D Mario games, or really just any games in general, that were released after the Nintendo 64 era. Yes, when the game came out, it was one of the first games of this scale to ever be made in 3D, so things like free camera control were seen as revolutionary. But some games that are revolutionary still hold up over 20 years later, and in fact, outstrip many AAA games released nowadays. But others, like Super Mario 64, have nothing to write on other than its initial groundbreaking success because trying to play this game nowadays is only pain. The controls are unbearably stiff and unforgiving, because you're only allowed to make major changes in the direction you're moving. No minor adjustments in your positioning are allowed, which becomes real frustrating real fast considering some of the jumps in this game. The camera is very similar in that it only progresses in stages. You don't have total control, you are only allowed to turn it to an extreme degree and no minor adjustments are allowed. These sudden jerky movements are extremely jarring and actually nauseating to look at, especially in these types of tight corridors or slides, and it certainly doesn't help that the camera clips in and out of objects in that you are literally not allowed to turn it in certain directions and have to rotate it the long way around to get the angle you want. But it's not even just the core mechanics. The actual mission design is garbage from racing against competitors that are slow as dirt and being forced to wait the entire duration of their run before you can get the star, trial and error treasure chest challenges, slide sections with abysmal handling, the game is just a slog to get through, and if you told me I'd have to 100% Super Mario 64 or Sunshine, I'd seriously have to think about it. And in case you're wondering why 64 is here instead of Sunshine when I have very little positive to say about that game, it's simple. Sunshine has a pretty solid first half and decent controls. Super Mario 64 has neither, and you will never, ever get me to play this game to completion no matter what. Super Mario 3D All-Stars is a collection of one amazing game, one subpar game, and one indefensible dumpster fire. If there was ever a game to teach the lesson of less is more, I never would have thought it'd be Rainbow Six Siege. Yet, and here we are. The developer's commitment to eventually reach 100 operators is digging this game's grave. It used to be about strategy, teamwork, and map control, but now it's just a competition to see which developers can come up with the wackiest new gameplay mechanic because they have to keep adding new operators in order to keep people coming back. That's the appeal of this game. What zany new gimmick are they gonna introduce next season? I can't wait to see! Why bother fixing critical audio issues, hitboxing, netcode, and balancing in an FPS game as competitive as it's trying to be, when you can just add colorful new cosmetics and shiny new toys to play with? But the shiny new toys they show off every season are either blatant ripoffs of older operators, thus rendering the original versions of them completely obsolete, or they come up with a new idea that's so ridiculously and blatantly overpowered, or laughable and pathetically underpowered, that they either make that one new operator irrelevant, or make ten other old operators irrelevant. The people working on this game desperately need to learn about quality over quantity. They're focusing on trying to get to 100 operators during this game's lifespan and adding a new map every single season instead of fixing what they already have, which is what's sinking the boat that is this game. Then again, maybe they shouldn't try to fix what they have, because every time they go back to try to rework an older map, they always, without fail, manage to make the map infinitely worse every single time. Speaking of maps, map ban may very well be the dumbest mechanic they've ever introduced. When you give players direct control over what maps they do and do not play, everyone just ends up playing the same maps over and over again. Map voting systems in multiplayer games are just a terrible idea. If you want to do something like this, put in a veto system. Don't put in a map ban or map voting system. Nothing ever good comes of this. The last time I played this game was last year when I made my 4K subscriber Q&A video and I got the exact same map both times in a row. Like, I just, I don't. Then again, I suppose I can't entirely blame the players because the map ban system wouldn't have even been a necessity in the first place if the developers didn't forget how to design maps that weren't way too goddamn big and lacked any sort of natural flow to them. And if you'll allow me a quick tangent, these people cannot stop changing the UI. The UI has been completely overhauled multiple times over the last few years for no goddamn reason and I will never understand why. Why do so many games do this? What is the point in changing a user interface that everybody is already familiar with when there's absolutely nothing wrong with it? And as if it even needs saying, playing an FPS on console with absolutely no aim assist just does not work. It is a necessity for console FPS games and if you implement it well, you won't even notice that there's any aim assist at at all, but the complete and utter lack of it makes it borderline unplayable with anything other than a mouse and keyboard. But to be honest, even if you do play with a mouse and keyboard, that's not going to be enough to save you from this game's horrible mechanics.
Oh, right. Only one game per series allowed on the list. Uh, Black Ops 3 it is. Not like it actually matters which one I pick because every Call of Duty game is exactly the same pile of garbage with a different coat of paint. There are two types of gameplay present in Call of Duty. Mindless running and gunning and slow as balls shooting galleries. The multiplayer is entirely the former, whereas the campaign flips back and forth between the former and the latter. In multiplayer, the time to kill is so high that there's no opportunity for tactical reversals and outplays. It's as simplistic as whoever sees who first wins. Again, mindless running and gunning. And in campaign, there is still absolutely no tactical decision making or strategic thinking required because the AI is completely brain dead and they just sit still and wait for you to shoot them. Alternatively, you'll encounter the second type of Call of Duty gameplay, which is the shooting galleries. If you're not brainlessly mowing down enemies that just sit still waiting to die, then you're stuck pinned down behind a single piece of cover and must meticulously pick off the enemies one at a time. It's mind-numbingly dull. The way in which these campaigns are laid out is static and lifeless. Halo's encounters play out differently each time because the AI is hyper-intelligent and dynamic, so it reacts to your movements and decisions accordingly and changes the strategy on the fly to make every encounter unique and every replay a different experience. But Call of Duty's encounters place the enemies in predetermined locations and they never, ever move. Again, you're just sitting there waiting to be shot. But it's not a beautiful dance of dynamic gameplay, it's peeking your head out to slowly shoot every enemy down one by one while they constantly bear down upon you and never let up. It's agonizing to endure. And to make matters worse, the franchise absolutely refuses to evolve or change in any meaningful way. It's the same goddamn thing every single year. It doesn't matter how many wacky exo moves you add in, fundamentally, it's still the same mindless, brain-dead gameplay that gets crapped out every single year with a different packaging. And I can only hope and pray that the Microsoft acquisition of Activision will finally free the studio from not only its toxic workplace culture, but also from this god-awful franchise so that the developers can work on literally anything else rather than being chained to it for the rest of their careers. What? The previous second place holder has fallen all the way down to seventh place? How could this have happened? Oh, you'll see. Now, for this one, I need to take you on a journey. I need to bring you along for an adventure, detailing everything I went through along my path to record footage for Fortnite. So I booted up the game for the first time since I recorded footage for it last year and was met with psychedelic visuals for a loading screen, which is already a bit of a weird start, but any confusion that I felt during the loading screens was immediately outmatched by this. I thought I knew what I signed up for when I decided to record Fortnite footage, but evidently not because I hadn't even gotten to the main menu yet before I was confused out of my mind. Apparently there's some stupid prologue you're forced to play through before you can even get to the main gameplay? Why? Why is this here? Why is there an interactive story prologue for this slob of a battle royale game? And why is there no skip option for people who don't care about it? Since when is Fortnite trying to take itself seriously with a story? Alright, so we're finally done with the prologue. Now it's time to actually play the game. Nope! Buy the battle pass, you stupid fuck! No, I am not kidding. I am not lying to you. Before you even see the main menu, the battle pass is shoved in your face with the no option shrunk down all the way to the bottom of the screen while the give us money option is prominently displayed. But then, as if once wasn't enough, once you back out of the initial battle pass screen, it shoves it into your face a second time. Like, guys, I know your only goal with this game is to make money and you don't actually care about making a good game as long as you can profit off the battle pass, but that does not mean you have to shove it down my throat twice before I even see the main menu. So then we finally get to the actual game where we meet a lobby full of dancing demons because that's just a state of Fortnite players, and then we finally load into the island where my first major problem with this game comes into play, which is how long it takes to get down from the battle bus in the first place. Not the skydiving part, the part where you hold on tight to a hanging glider and just sit there floating until you finally touch the ground. All you can do is wait as you sit there and follow the speed of molasses. You can't speed this process up at all. Why does this take so long? Man, I sure do love games when you sit around doing nothing forever. Video games are more fun when you're not actually playing them after all. But fine, whatever, let's just talk about the actual proper battle royale gameplay, which is just as garbage as every other combat-based battle royale game ever made. It's the same schlock with a different coat of paint with criticisms that can be applied to every single round of Battle Royale that has ever been played. You spend 90% of the game running around aimlessly looking for someone to shoot and relying on loot drop RNG that artificially applies value to weapons based on nothing but what color they are. You engage in a maximum of one, maybe two battles in a 20 minute match, all of which last a matter of seconds. But most of it is just running around the map looking for shit. Then we have problems specific to this game, which are the atrocious building mechanics. The ability to build whatever you want, wherever you want, it eliminates any and all sense of strategy this game could have had. Because if you're in a bad spot, you can just push one button and you're immediately safe. And with no effort whatsoever, you can just push five buttons and build yourself your own personal fortress. There is no punishment for bad positioning because there is no strategy involved in this game at all. 90% of Fortnite is boring as shit, and the remaining 10% is mindless and infuriating due to the weapon drop being complete RNG and battles boiling down to a Minecraft building competition. And my hatred of this game is only further exacerbated by the toxic as hell community which is spearheaded by Mr. Stream Sniper the fuck you say to me, you little shit ninja. The battle royale genre and the battle pass system is a tumorous, infectious cancer 
transfer that has spread all throughout the gaming industry, and I trace it all back to this game as the catalyst that started it all and led us into this downward spiral. Thankfully, Halo isn't getting a Battle Royale mode, and it is so glorious to see this game being so universally adored just to rub it in the face of this guy and every other diehard Battle Royale Twitch streamer out there. And most importantly, Master Chief is nowhere to be found in the Fortnite store. All is well with the world. textbook definition of a clusterfuck. Just a giant tidal wave of calamity where a bunch of jelly beans are crowding around each other, making navigating any of the levels a massive pain in the ass. Especially on ones where the path is exceedingly narrow. My favorite part is when you get knocked off due to the sheer amount of players on screen. Assuming the controls haven't already dicked you over because the game controls like garbage. You are constantly fighting against the game to jump across these platforms because of how heavy your character is and how floaty you feel as a result. Which is inexcusable in a competitive online platforming game. The jumping mechanics in a platforming game are clunky as hell and diving kills any and all momentum. Unlike in something like Super Mario Sunshine where you can chain together satisfying movement sequences because your momentum is maintained between actions. I'm looking to Super Mario Sunshine for better game design. If I have to do that, you significantly blundered somewhere along the way. And why can you grab people? Why is this a thing? Why can you be screwed over in the final seconds of the round because you're too close to someone else despite having zero control over your movement speed? Who put this into the game? Was it the same idiot that programmed the camera that can obstruct your view as the obstacles get in the way? Or perhaps it was the one who designed the team games which are just patently unfair. The optimal strategy for team games is not to win, it's to not lose. Meaning that at a certain point, all it boils down to is picking on the losing team which results in a completely unfair 2v1 situation, which is most prevalent in games like Egg Scramble and Hoarders, the latter of which is even more frustrating due to how bafflingly erratic the ball movement is. But even in team games where this doesn't apply, there are other problems that are almost worse, such as Hoopsie Daisy which amounts to nothing but RNG hoop spawns, and tail tag which has a binary win condition of whoever is holding that tail at the end where there's absolutely nothing you can do to help your teammates. You can play perfect the entire game and possess the tail the entire time, only for some random bullshit to happen that results in someone else grabbing the tail at the last possible second. It is more beneficial to do literally nothing until the final seconds of the game because the score system isn't determined by how long you hold the tail for, it's determined by simply whether you have the tail or not. Utter dog shit. Okay, so team games suck, but at least free-for-alls are great. No! Those are just as bad because they're what I refer to when I say clusterfuck. As I mentioned earlier, you can and will get screwed over, not because of any platforming failures on your part, but because you either get grabbed arbitrarily or because there's too many goddamn things on the screen. And for what's supposed to be a fast-paced, hectic, free-for-all platformer, there sure are a lot of instances of doing nothing but waiting around for things to happen in this game. Also, remember earlier when I was talking about frustrating controls? Well, those are most noticeable in games like Lily Leapers, where there's absolutely no minor momentum for bouncing on trampolines. Bouncing on a trampoline, which sends you launching into the air for an extended period of time gives you almost no mid-air control over your movement. Brilliant. But that's not even all that's wrong here, because for certain obstacles, the challenge is generated purely from the trial and error of what the exact correct spot to land on is because you can't adjust your position mid-air, meaning that if you don't land at the right angle immediately, you are dead! And I sure do like games like Whirla Gig, where it's legitimately more advantageous to deliberately allow yourself to be hit by the spinning things in order to launch yourself further ahead. And I really like games where the dominant strategy is to sit around at spawn waiting for the other player to find the correct path forward because it's damn near impossible to see which ones are gonna fall so it's more beneficial to wait around until it's almost completed and then make a straight dash to the finish line! Great game! And we haven't even gone over the tumultuous journey I took to even play this game at all. My original plan was to buy the game on Steam and then record it on PC, but Fall Guys just straight up refused to launch on Steam. It would not boot up no matter what I tried, my computer was trying to warn me against playing such a terrible video game. Then, when it finally did launch for unknown reasons, I was then frozen on the loading screen, and no amount of troubleshooting was able to fix this issue because nobody knows how to fix it. No forums I found on offered any kind of a solution, which forced me to refund the game and then buy it on my favorite console of all time, the PlayStation 5! Yay! I already hated it, but then I realized that in order to even play this game in the first place, you need to have an Epic account, even if you play on Steam and not the Epic Store, because fuck you, that's why! This game is terrible, and I would honestly rather play the Wipeout game for the Wii. It may be a low-effort TV tie-in, but it's still a million times more fun than this sludge. I really don't know why I didn't include this game on the list the first time around, but in hindsight, I'm glad I waited because, oh 
boy has Among Us somehow gotten even worse over the course of the past year. Let's get something straight right out of the gate. I don't want to hear about how it's fun if you play with the right group of people, because if you tell me that, then you're only further highlighting the issue. The quality of your experience in this game is 100% dependent on other people being smart. But the problem is that other people are brain dead, and that makes the experience insufferable, because it's not a battle of deception to outwit the others and see if you can identify logical contradictions and pursue the truth. It's a bunch of mindless sheep following the flock to vote for the most hated person of the round. Don't believe me? Well, let's take a look at some examples, shall we? First up, we have the most common trend among people who play this game. One person says, this color is suspicious, or it's this color, and then everyone else immediately votes for that person without any sense of logical reasoning whatsoever. Green did nothing wrong here, he just committed the unforgivable crime of existing in an Among Us game, and thus someone randomly said he was suspicious and was therefore ejected for it. But even if he was doing something suspicious, that's literally irrelevant because the only means we had to determine that was this one person's testimony which absolutely nobody questioned or pressed more information at all and could easily have been lying. And then they did it again, and again, and would you look at that, they were not the imposter! Meaning they were ejected from the game, not because of anything they did wrong, or because an elaborate lie was told by the imposter, but because some random idiot was like, hey guys, it's white! And then the mindless sheep all followed suit. Phenomenal. Just such enriching, intelligent discourse. And I certainly hope you're not going to say, uh, that guy's obviously the imposter. That's a good strategy on his part. Because if you are, then one, wow, your standards for what constitutes a good strategy are whack. Two, that should not work as a strategy. You shouldn't be able to just say it's this person completely randomly with no evidence and having done nothing to earn anybody's trust and have that work. Three. No! He wasn't the imposter! He's just a moron or a pathetic troll! Next, we have the second most common trend in Among Us discourse. Automatically defaulting to voting at the person who reported the body. Literally no information is shared outside of where the body was found. It is the first report of the game and they immediately point to the reporter with once again, zero evidence. Bring in the mindless sheep! Sometimes it'll even happen after absolutely no discourse at all. Sometimes you will literally just report the body, say where you found it, nobody else will say a fucking thing, and then the sheep army charges into battle and you get fucked by absolutely no fault of your own. And then it happens again, and again! Boy, howdy, this sure is a well-designed video game! And that's just the broad problems that can be applied to almost every single round of this god-awful game. Now, let's take a look at some of the unexpected situational bullshit that happened while I was recording footage for this video, and see how bad things can really get. I'm so sus accuses Bell of faking keys. Bell's rebuttal is, I was talking and got distracted. I'm so sus his only recourse is... Oh. What? You accepted that rebuttal? That doesn't account for the accusation you just made! But that's not even the worst thing to come out of this game. Later, Bell and I run down into O2 from Electrical. Bell kills TIE Freighter and then runs back into Electrical. Why she thought doing this was a good idea when she knew I was right there is absolutely beyond me, but hey, maybe she knew she'd get away with it due to the fact that the people who play this game are brain dead because after I reported the body, I wanted to say that Bell killed TIE Freighter. Except, I didn't see the name tag. I only saw the color of the space uniform because it's much easier in the heat of the moment to identify purple killed green than it is to say, Bell killed TIE Freighter. But because this game is really shit, the way this auto-chat works is that you have to know the username of who was killed in order to make the accusation. But as if that's not bad enough, this moron says, Bell killed on cams, it couldn't have been her, and everyone believes them! Despite the fact that Bell was unaccounted for while this dumbass was sitting on the cameras, meaning there was a substantial period of time that her alibi was not accounted for that this person cannot defend! But there is no auto-chat option for that! That doesn't fit one of the prescribed auto-chat situations, so I can't do shit in this meeting except say the very convincing phrase of, Jeez. Lying! Whatever she says, it's not true! Oh, but wait! It gets worse! Because the next person to die in this round is me! The only one who knew the truth that she was the imposter was immediately killed off, and nobody calls it out in the next meeting. But not only that, in this next meeting, someone else who is completely unrelated to me accuses Belle of being the culprit. And the fact that I was killed should only further bolster the idea that Belle was the imposter because I wasn't voted out, I was killed. Meaning I absolutely was not the imposter and wouldn't have been lying about what Belle did. And now that someone else has cast suspicion upon her, there should be no room for doubt, and yet the same dumb fuck from earlier adamantly stands by her screaming that it wasn't Belle, and so everyone gangs up on the line player and thus the game is then lost! Congratulations you fucking moron, you lost everybody the game! But Magic, are you dumb? That person was obviously the imposter! No! No they fucking were, they were just a moron! Again! That's all this game is, dealing with people that are actually brain dead, it's infuriating to play! There is no intelligent discourse to be found in 99% of the rounds I've played in this game, and things only get worse given the fact that people leave the lobby if they don't get the imposter role or if they 
die. And because of that, all I had to do in one round was literally kill one person and the round was immediately won because almost the entire lobby had already left despite the fact that the game had already started and nobody had died yet. And let's talk a little bit more about that dumbass auto chat feature, shall we? This auto chat function is impossible to use. The options you have to choose from are way too broad and not appropriate at all for specific situations. It forces you to pay attention to the name tags because you can't just say blue killed green for some stupid reason. And even navigating the menus is insanely cumbersome. And don't even get me started on completing tasks while playing on a console. Because aside from the fact that the items don't actually lock in place for some of them, there is an artificial shaking effect that is placed on your cursor despite the fact that you already have an inherent disadvantage because you're using a controller. So the big brains that made this game thought that making it even harder for a controller player was a brilliant idea and makes completing this Asteroids minigame more painful than playing Super Mario Sunshine. No! You're playing public lobbies! You gotta play private lobbies! Yeah. Okay, that's a bullshit defense anyway because the option is there. It's a way to play. I shouldn't have a garbage experience going online because not everybody has 10 to 15 friends willing to chop many years off their lifespan by getting together to play this terrible game. But alright, let's look at some examples of private lobbies, shall we? First, we have this insanity during one of Shift's live streams. I really, you just need to watch this video for yourself to get a proper understanding of how idiotic this was. Next, we have Jacksepticeye's play sessions, featuring PewDiePie accusing Sean for no reason and then proceeding to get pissy when he gets accused for no reason, or my personal favorite, which is everyone accusing Sean because the bar didn't go up when he did the card swipe, despite that logic being blatantly flawed because the card swipe is delayed. And finally, we have the last game played during the Game Theorist St. Jude charity livestream in December of 2020. I guess if Diana found the body, the thing you sabotaged? Have also where'd, you, where'd you separate him? Where'd you separate him? The arrow that you sabotaged? <laughs> I'm gonna vote you if you don't say something. Where'd you separate with him? I was leaving. Oh, you! Oh my god! Okay. <laughs> I don't know if I <laughs> my brain broke when I watched this happen live. There's obviously the issue of them constantly talking over him and not letting him explain himself. And then when this guy said, oh, I'm gonna vote you if you don't say something, dude. At which point Marquez probably said something to explain himself, and before he could get even a single syllable out, they voted for him. Yeah, this is so much better than public lobbies, let me tell you. But even if you detach the game from its community and just look at its actual design, it still comes out to be a heaping pile of trash. For one thing, there's only one decent map the skill. The other three maps are all horrific for one reason or another. Polis sucks because your progress is constantly stinted by artificial door locks and decontamination hallways. So much of it boils down to navigating tight corridors and overly claustrophobic areas despite having some of the most open designs of the three maps. And there are so many goddamn dead ends. Mirror HQ is too goddamn small for the imposter to be able to do anything even remotely successful while simultaneously being a pain to navigate because there is no natural flow to it. It's segmented off into a bunch of different corridors. And the airship is by far the worst of the bunch. It's an amalgamation of everything wrong with this game. It's way too fucking big for its own good and has way too many goddamn dead ends. Even worse than Polis. Navigating this thing is a massive pain in the ass because it's even more segmented than Mirror HQ and a lot of getting around boils down to waiting for these slow-ass platforms to get moving. It was so agonizing to get anywhere that at a certain point I was just praying for the imposter to kill me so I could just get my tasks done easier. Speaking of tasks, though, fuck the garbage minigame. The trash bag just does not leave the bin. No matter how much you bounce it up and down, it just stays trapped like it's super glued inside. And while we're tearing minigames to shreds, this switch flipping minigame is horrible because it accepts everybody's input simultaneously, meaning you're in a constant tug of war battle with the other players to reset the damn lights. It's also horrifically unoptimized with loading screens that give Persona 5 Strikers a run for its money, except at least in that game you can tell it's supposed to be a loading screen, whereas Among Us just leaves you stranded on a black screen wondering if your game froze. The server browser actually lies to you because the player counts don't update in real time, so even if it says there's room in a server, by the time you actually click on it, it may have already filled up. Up, and this happens way too often and makes joining a game a massive pain in the ass. And the server desync problems are atrocious, which is unacceptable in a game dependent on accurately calling out the positions of other players. Among Us is a terribly designed game with a terrible community surrounding it, and when you combine those two things together, you get digital sewage. <sighs> But hey, that's the last of the multiplayer games on this list. The remaining four games on the list are all single-player, story-driven experiences, so in theory, they shouldn't piss me off as much, right? Right? the least conclusive conclusion to a story ever written. Visually, the character models and graphics were repulsive to look at. The animations were stiff, unfinished, and comical in some instances, and as far as the gameplay is concerned, some puzzle rooms were admittedly decent, but the majority of them were either too easy or too esoteric and could only be solved by the game explicitly telling you what to do. Also, the newly introduced ability to look around in any direction you want is nullified by the absurdly narrow FOV, but all of that pales in comparison to how this game handles its plot and characters. You would 
would be forgiven for thinking these are not the same characters from the previous games because not only are they not even remotely similar in terms of their appearances, their personalities are completely contradicted to how they used to act with Akane being the worst offender. She's blatantly character assassinated. She was arguably the most intelligent and level-headed character in the entire series, while doing a remarkably impressive job of convincing the group otherwise. And now she's a belligerent, unhinged, bumbling idiot who couldn't pour water out of a boot with instructions written on the bottom. And I'm getting Toy Story 4 vibes here, because it almost seems like the reason why they wrote all the old characters to be trash is so that you'll think the new characters are just so much better. Why? Why would you do this? Why would you introduce five brand new characters to the finale of your trilogy and completely abandon everyone else's journeys outside of this one cringeworthy scene where Junpei doesn't know right from left? Especially when your new characters are actually the worst things ever created. Q team sucks. Eric is a deranged, love-struck psychopath. Q is the robotic clone. And Mira is literally a serial killer that the game wants you to think is totally cool and nobody in the game has any issue with her at all. And that's just one team. Carlos is just a blank slate with no character or endearing personality traits who's only in this game to try to appeal to new Zero Escape players in what's supposed to be the finale of your story and to make Junpei and Akane seem worthless in comparison. And Diana's only endearing elements are the things that link her to Sigma and Phi. Her abusive ex-husband storyline was dropped as soon as it was brought up. Literally a massive exposition dump that was immediately forgotten. Yet, even with all of that, the plot is somehow even worse. There are no stakes in this story anymore because every single one of these characters can jump around freely. It's no longer one or two people thus making the ability inherently very special. Literally everyone can do it. Also, this whole their memory will be reset thing is totally arbitrary conflict because you can just write down a note so you don't forget what happens! And this game is the textbook example of retroactively making the previous games worse by creating gaping holes or at the very least recontextualizing previous events to now be running on contrivance and luck. Not to mention the absurdity of aliens bringing a teleportation device to Earth or mind hacking or literal mind control. Not like that ever would have been useful for anything at any point. Or the insanity of the villain somehow managing to survive and remain under the radar for over a century, and that his plan makes no sense because he wanted to convince the heroes to save the world despite the fact that saving the world was the entire reason they were there in the first place. Delta is a walking contradiction whose existence is predicated on a bootstrap paradox in that he cannot be born without himself ensuring that he will be birthed, which he cannot do unless he's already born, which is only allowed to happen due to the sheer insanity of Sigma and Diana leaving their children to fend for themselves. This story was screwed from the start because the premise of this universe is time travel like utilizes multiple timelines you're constantly jumping between, meaning you haven't saved anything. The Virtue's Last Reward timeline is dead forever, and we only saved one, meaning there's still an infinite number of timelines where the world is destroyed, and there's also an infinite number of timelines where the world is saved. Why the hell do I give a shit about just one of them? Especially when the characters are willing to carelessly sacrifice other versions of themselves from a different timeline just so they can live. And the final nail in the coffin is that at the end of the day, after all this insanity, the characters all collectively decide to just pretend this game never happened at all, and then pretend that Virtue's Last Reward never happened at all, leaving you to wonder what in the world was the point of any of this nonsense in the first place. They still don't know anything about the religious fanatic. They can't do anything. And we didn't even give a shit about the stupid religious fanatic until this game. What about the story of Virtue's Last Reward? Why was I invested in this world? Why did I follow these characters through all their adventures if you were just gonna tell me to go fuck myself at the end for caring about them? Zero Time Dilemma directly spits in the face of the entire Zero Escape series, either through incompetence or malice. But either way, it's so bad that I legitimately cannot recommend this series to anyone anymore. Because there is no point where you can stop at that won't leave you wanting more. It ruined the entire series, and I am strongly, strongly contemplating dedicating an entire video just to this game one day, because that is how utterly indefensible it is. Though, while we're on the subject of games that will be getting a dedicated analysis treatment... Surprising no one, it's time once again to talk about our favorite illiterate Captain Shithead. Let's run through the greatest hits of what makes this game so awful. To start with, this game's script is broken. Every single case is bleeding with critical logic errors, even more than I discovered on my first playthrough two years ago. Significantly more, as a matter of fact. Even I was stunned by just how broken this story truly is upon my recent playthroughs. The obvious highlight is the entirety of Turnabout Serenade, during which a 14-year-old kid whom they believe to be blind is accused of firing a .45 caliber revolver, while also believing that he was capable of dragging him all the way to the stage despite clearly not having the strength to be able to do so while also being found unconscious next to him. On top of the fact that detectives check for fingerprints in the vent but not on the murder weapon itself despite the fact that Emma Sky is on the case, and the fact that the victim says siren to Apollo instead of just saying who the killer was and ending the case immediately- <sighs> And that's just the tip of the iceberg. When you combine a logically incoherent story with the deliberate assassination of both Phoenix Wright and Emma Sky, and even Gumshoe, albeit to a lesser extent, as well as with new gameplay mechanics that are nothing but 
pain to use, you ultimately have one of the worst video games ever made. Now, was that a briefer synopsis than the majority of the other games on this list? Yes, yes it was. But that's because I don't want to go too in-depth here since a critique of Apollo Justice is right around the corner. The only thing I have left to say is to address the question I see parroted around a lot of, is this game really still top 3 material even after Dual Destiny's Spirit of Justice? And the answer is yes, it absolutely is. Why? Well, because while it may be an undeniable truth that those two games managed to systematically and surgically make amends for every single thing that Apollo Justice massively screwed up and saved the Ace Attorney series, Apollo Justice is still broken as a standalone game. The knowledge that their assassinations would be resolved does not make their initial impact sting any less, especially since the seven-year period of stasis after his triumph and victory and trials and tribulations can never be fully repaired, and it doesn't resolve this game's self-contained narrative, which is dependent on an inability to think critically in order to barely function properly. But then, if that's the case, then why is it only number three? Why has a game that I once so confidently declared as the worst game I've ever played now been dethroned only to spot number three? Well, it does not mean that I now think the game has gotten any better. It just means that our top two placements have, somehow, against all odds, managed to defy expectations and cement their reputation as being so bad that they're even worse than this absolutely inexcusable dumpster fire. So, who are our winners? Well, if you've been paying any attention to this list thus far, you've likely noticed a curious absence of a certain franchise from any of the spots. And if you've noticed that, then you know exactly what's coming up next. I really, really struggled to decide which game would earn this spot. As a reminder, I've imposed a rule that I'm only allowed to have one game per series on this list. And to be frank, that rule was imposed specifically so that we wouldn't end up talking about three Danganronpa games in a row. Because, let's be clear, they'd all be up here in the top five otherwise. Of course, I could always just say Danganronpa Decadence is one of the games and call it a day, but let's not take the easy way out. So then, which Danganronpa game is most deserving of the title of second worst game I've ever played? Well, after much deliberation, the conclusion I've arrived at is that for as much of a morally reprehensible, mechanically imbalanced nightmare as Ultra Despair Girls is, and for as little effort as was put into Ultimate Summer Camp, for as laughably horrible its dialogue is, for as brain dead as its combat mechanics are, for as out of character as these bonus interactions are, and for as greedy as its EA microtransaction system is in regards to blatantly locking characters behind paywalls like it's a gotcha game, the degree to which V3 utterly and irreparably nuked the entire universe of Danganronpa is something I just cannot overlook. Of course, there's the massive can of worms that is the ending, but this game was broken long before that ever happened. And when I say broken, I mean beyond just the standard Danganronpa gameplay being broken, and beyond everything about this stupid tunnel minigame, and beyond just the mere existence of this nightmare cave. Every single case except for the fourth one is either entirely reliant on contrivance and luck, or just straight up makes no goddamn sense and blatantly ignores the laws of physics in order to to try and pull one over on the audience to trick you into thinking the writers are really smart. The magical shot putt ball, the unlucky motive video delivery, the complete and utter nonsense surrounding every aspect of this seance, as well as this absolutely ridiculous motive that doesn't hold up under scrutiny no matter how you look at it, and the sheer impossibility of this little switcheroo they do. It's all just such garbage. If you're looking for something with clever mysteries for you to solve, then this is not the game for you. You'll either figure out everything about the case immediately, or you'll be left scratching your head until the final seconds, not because you failed to deduce things properly, but because you assumed we were in a world where basic laws of physics and simple, easy logic applied. And that's not even mentioning the fact that the entire game is made pointless after nothing more than just the first chapter. Because while the killing games were horrible, evil events put on by Junko and Ashima, they would always abide by the rules, and Monokuma had always previously gone out of his way to make sure they were followed to a T. But in this game, within the very first chapter, they deliberately break the rule that only the blackened is to be punished, and the second they do so, the stakes of this game are nullified. Why would I care about anything that happens in this story if you're trying to center a killing game around these ultra-important rules, while simultaneously shadowing them into oblivion in the first chapter of the game? Then there's the ending. The ending that left me with no words, and yet I had so much to say. The ending that rendered every substantive event and character arc that happened prior to this point entirely meaningless. I need you to understand how bad this is. Danganronpa 3 destroyed this world. It blatantly assassinated multiple characters, told the most outlandish and contradictory story yet, made no attempt to resolve the overarching storyline of the series, and left the world in a state that made you wonder what the point of anything even was. There was nothing left to break. The 
universe of Dayadrapa had already been destroyed. And yet, Spike Chunsoft still managed to find a way to destroy it even further by recontextualizing the events of the series prior to V3 as nothing more than a TV show put on for the entertainment of the world, meaning that none of those stories ever actually happened. Makoto, Hajime, and Kamaru didn't do anything to save the world. There was no world to save, it was all fake. Any moment of significant growth and development for the characters was all made pointless by denouncing it all as nothing more than fiction. Even if the cast of characters for this game was the best in the series, which they're most definitely not, it wouldn't matter at all. Nothing can transcend this level of universal decimation. There is no defending this. It took the events of a seven-year-long series and threw them all out the window without a care in the world in favor of pulling the rug out from under the audience. It made me never want to touch the series again because for as much as I still enjoy the first two games overall, why would I have any reason to care about them anymore when I know full well it's all fake and nothing they're doing in that universe ever actually mattered? <sighs> I've spoken to no end about how completely horrible Danganronpa is, and how V3 literally makes the first three games in the anime entirely irrelevant, alongside a slew of cases that make no sense at all despite the writers clearly thinking they were geniuses for some of these plot twists, and gameplay that's so fundamentally broken you wonder how you go this awry when the series you're very obviously trying to rip off has nailed its basic courtroom gameplay for over two decades now. So then, what's left? If the game is truly this horrible to play, if it's this internally balked in terms of consistency, and if it deals this much irreparable damage to the world of Danganronpa, then what has surpassed it? What's taken the grand prize? What in the world could possibly be worse than Danganronpa V3 killing Harmony? Well, for as much as it's gonna pain me to do it, let's move on to the number one slot and see just how bad a game can get. Never in a million years could I have ever predicted that the series would fall this far. Admittedly, I did have concerns about Seal Wolf's ability to carry the FNAF franchise into the future. They crafted an incredible tribute to the series and Help Wanted with faithfully recreated VR versions of the original games, as well as unique one-off minigames in both the base game and Curse of Dreadbear DLC. But the operative part of that sentence is one-off. Help Wanted is an incredible tribute and a whole lot of fun to play, but it is, at its core, a collection of minigames. Even though plenty of them were original Seal Wolf creators, that doesn't change the fact that they were still nothing more than one-off, five-minute adventures at maximum. The team had absolutely no experience crafting a full-fledged original FNAF game, and especially not something this insanely ambitious. And yet, even with all my concerns, I was still more than willing to go into this new game with an open mind to see just what the studio was cooking up given how much they killed it with Help Wanted, but my faith could not have been more horrifically misplaced, because Five Nights at Freddy's Security Breach was so much worse than anything I ever could have possibly possibly imagined. First of all, the AI blatantly cheats. There's no sense of consistency with their movement and the layout of the pizza plex because it doesn't matter. They're just gonna teleport around anyway, and sometimes they'll even do it right in front of you. Technologically speaking, the game runs like complete garbage and for no justifiable reason given how absolutely horrific and choppy the animations and visuals are, sometimes at the expense of your success. Speaking of which, there's no reason to even have doors in this place at all because everything is capable of raising all the metal shutters, and the standard doors will just randomly disappear and let the animatronics romp on through, assuming they can't just magically open them up anyway. A majority of the gameplay mechanics are blatantly broken and unfair. The saving and checkpoint system is horrendous when compounded with the AI that literally cheats the game to kill you. Assuming you haven't already been softlocked or fallen through the geometry of the map or had your safe file corrupted or just had your game constantly crashed anyway because fuck it, why not? And that's just a few of so many other problems with this game both in terms of its gameplay and presentation. But if that was all that was wrong, I honestly might have been able to brush it off and hope that one day, in the far future, this stuff gets heavily retuned rebalanced, and fixed with a patch. But it's not all that's wrong. The biggest problem with Security Breach is something that cannot be fixed with a patch. The story. Putting aside the fact that the actual in-game plot is awfully written with gaping holes, inconsistencies, and contrivances despite being so laughably paper-thin in a pathetic attempt to try to string together these brain-dead minigames, it completely and utterly annihilates the ingenious ending of Pizzeria Simulator. Remember how this was the definitive ending for the series, excluding the epilogue and VR tribute? The conclusion of the story and the culmination of three years worth of build-up, where the killer's victims were finally at peace, all loose ends were tied up, and the Afton family was released and and freed together, with the only exception being Springtrap, who was cast into the darkest pit of hell to swallow him whole, for all the atrocities he committed in this final, spine-chilling cutscene and speech by Henry. Yeah? Well, guess what? None of that matters anymore. Because you know who comes back in the game's true canonical ending? None other than Springtrap himself. 
again. Despite Ultimate Custom Knight confirming his death by being eternally trapped in hell, tormented by Cassidy for all of eternity, he's back. He's risen from the ashes, meaning that everything Henry and Michael fought for means absolutely nothing. It was irrelevant. They didn't end Spring Trap. They didn't cast William Afton into the pits of hell. They just mildly inconvenienced him long enough to rise again in the remains of Pizzeria Simulator buried beneath the pizza plex. And he's not the only victim of this garbage writing. Michael Afton, the crying child, and everyone else Henry tried to burn in Pizzeria Simulator, including Elizabeth, is still alive and well in some capacity, and now they're trying to tell you actually fuck that ending, it was the big bad. Now the characters are finally at peace with the demons they've been battling, William Afton has actually been defeated for real this time, and everyone can finally live happily ever after. Fuck off. It's awful. It's atrocious. It's abysmal. It's so shockingly bad from every facet of design that I cannot possibly cover it all in what little time I have left in this video. It angered me so much because of its gameplay, performance, and storytelling that it will be getting an entire video dedicated to breaking down just how much it destroyed this series beyond any hope of salvation. So hold on tight, everybody, because I'm going to rip this game to shreds. And thus concludes my list of the top 20 worst games I have ever played, updated as of 2022. Now all we can do is hope that this year won't provide me with even more games that will fundamentally shatter this list even more than 2021 did. Please, please don't let this year give me more soul-crushing video games. My, my heart can't take this anymore. Thanks for watching, everyone. Hopefully you found my abbreviated commentary on these games insightful, and given that I saw some people requesting this list rework, I hope the video was worth the wait and you found it entertaining. And feel free to share your own list of worst games in the comments. What are some of your least favorite games of all time? Does your list have any crossover with mine? I'm very interested to in see what you guys come up with. I've played a lot of crap games in my life, so you might remind me of something that I missed. And for anybody out there who's sick of me being negative all the time, then you'll be happy to know that as a counterbalance to this video, next week I'll be making one going over the top 20 best games I've ever played. Of course, you'll see some familiar faces there as well, but there are other games beyond the top 10 that I've not gotten the chance to praise in depth, and I'm really excited to talk about all of that. Other than that, I'd like to thank you all for watching, and hope to see you all next week for my top 20 best games I've ever played. Goodbye!